Welcome to the official YouTube channel for the Colin Coward Podcast. Go on, hit the subscribe button. There you go, right down there. If you wanna be among the first to hear my weekly takes, NFL, college football, more, right there. The one thing I like about Buffalo, and in previous years, um, I thought they were very, very reliant on Josh Allen's superpowers. But Khalil Shakir, uh, uh, James Cook, they're a little twitchier. They're a little better after the catch. It gives them a little spice. They're a little less Josh reliant. He still had the play of the game. But I, yeah. when I do watch their offense, I'm like, there, there are gears to it now. And I didn't really feel there were gears. There are times Stephon Dix dis disappears for a quarter, and they're fine. And, and that, to me, feels more like a Super Bowl team where previously it was like, okay, can Josh, it, it was almost like watching a high school offense with a division one quarterback. You're like, all right, four or five touchdowns. I feel they're balanced, even though Josh is still putting up like league leading numbers. Totally agree. I mean, the definitive drive to me is they get the ball back up a touchdown with about 10 minutes left. And there were a couple Josh Allen runs in there, which ultimately was capped off by the Shakir touchdown, who in that offense, right, they had Cole Beasley forever. That, that's a great little security blanket over the middle of the field. They hit digs on a screen, and Cook had several runs. I mean, he's he's a legitimate player right now. Yes. So, uh, you know, this is it kind of becoming uh, the Brady Manning, now Mahomes and Allen next week. It's Mahomes' first ever road game. And I think for the first time, you feel Buffalo can win. I mean, I, I haven't seen the line yet. I'm sure they're going to be favored. It's a tough place to play. And Josh, I, I texted a buddy in the league. I don't think he's the best quarterback, but he's definitely has the most raw talent of any quarterback yeah. in the NFL, right? And, and it was on full display with some of those. He, he's a cheat code in, in cold weather, which they said at the kickoff, it was negative, you know, zero degrees at the field. The yeah. wind, the chill, he's unfazed, a lot like Mahomes. So that was always a huge advantage in the Brady-Manning thing, right? Brady had a huge advantage if the game was in New England. Well, this, it's, it's a coin flip, right? Mahomes and Allen, there's no difference when they're outside. And to me, I, I totally agree. They're a little more balanced. And, and Diggs at any moment can make a big play. But the, Cook's emergence this season really has taken their team. They, they feel like the real deal. Now, can they overcome some of the injuries? They have some scar tissue in some of these big moments. Like, what yeah. happens next week if it's 20 to 14 going into the fourth quarter and they're down? Do they get tight? Does that place get tight today? Right. They had the momentum. The Steelers, let's face it, a little bit of a fraudulent team. You yeah. know, historically in the playoffs, seven seeds weren't even there. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm bullish on Buffalo. They, they've really – never forget when Ty Dunn, I know you have him on, friend of mine. Yeah. That definitive piece that he wrote, it felt like, well – they're going to start losing a bunch of games, and this guy's going to get fired. They never lost, and they still haven't lost to this day. So they, you talk about a team with a lot of momentum. Uh, you you got to like where the Bills, the way they've played over the last, whatever, six-plus weeks, right? Well, and the other thing, Ty Dunn's article wasn't inaccurate. What the Bills did, in which good operations do, remember when Tom Coughlin started getting heat, and instead of holding a grudge, Tom Coughlin improved. He listened to his Light, players. Lightened up. Sh yep. Sean McDermott. Instead of getting defensive, McDermott's like, we got some issues here, and a lot of them are me. And so they make a change at OC. So, you know, when it, whenever a reporter writes something um, and has inside sources, they're, they're, you're, you're, you have sources, and there was unhappiness in the room. But I think, much like a Coughlin, a McDermott's like, okay, listen, this can go two ways. I can be stubborn yeah. and get fired. And by the way, a lot of coaches would, or I can learn from it. You know, and Sean's a fighter, high school wrestler, tough guy, fighter, been around the league a long time. And I think, I think Sean also knows there's three quarterbacks in the league that are just different. Lamar, Josh, and Mahomes. There's a lot of good players. Those guys are different. They can just peel off a 28 yard run at any moment and be faster than the defensive players chasing them. You know, I like Herbert, but he can be a bit wooden. I like yeah. Trevor Lawrence, but sometimes I don't think he's that accurate. There's a lot of guys I like. CJ Stroud's excellent. He's a lot like Goff, clean pocket, beautiful, not a real mover. But I think, I think Sean McDermott looks at this and thinks, okay, if I left, I will get no more Josh. <laughs> he like, yeah, like every, never everybody's always again. like, Everybody's always like, John Harbaugh really embraces Lamar. 
Well, no shit. There's one on the planet. <laughs> it's not hard to go. They don't make them like that. So it, it's, I, I think Buffalo, you know, had a fork in the road and McDermott's like, we have to be open and communicate. And I like them. I, this is an easy team to root for. They're kind of like Detroit in the AFC been beaten up historically. I like them. I would say this about Sean McDermott having spent a year around him. A lot of defensive coaches can just kind of lean tough guy meathead. And at yeah. Sean's core, he is a tough guy. But he's a well-read intellectual, right? He could have a conversation with you about a lot of different things. He's not just some old school, hit you, hit you, hit you. Now, his personality, he can get tight, as was written about in that article. But he is a smart guy. I mean, this is someone that could have worked in finance. This is a guy that could have been successful in a lot of different industries. And to me, he does a lot of, deserves a lot of credit for clearly just maintaining that infrastructure inside the team. Because sometimes you can unravel in, sure. in that situation. They were six and six. They were headed to implode. Yeah. Now they're hosting the second round, right? I mean, they, they, they've they turned this thing around and quick. Now they benefited because the team that they had to catch in the division was not Brady and Belichick. It, it was Tua and a team that was getting injured, losing multiple players a game for a month straight. But I, I give this Bills team, you talk about a team that went through a lot of shit early in the season, and, and now they have a player that on any given on, you know week, on any given game, I don't care if you got Patrick Mahomes, I don't care if you got Lamar Jackson, which is the two teams are going to play the next two weeks, they can have the best player on the field, which you saw today. He had stretches where it's like, I don't know if I've ever seen that quite before from a pocket passer, right? Because yeah. he's running like Cam Newton, but then he's throwing like Elway or Marino. Now they have a short week. Um, they face Kansas City, but I do think many of their best players have been around the block, the coaching staff. I, I don't think short weeks necessarily are punitive to a Baltimore, Kansas City, Philadelphia. I mean, I mean, these teams play on Thursday, and the yeah. good teams are usually ready to go. So I, I don't think that's punishing. And I, they're I wanna, at home. Yeah, yeah. So I think I think you know Buffalo should be favored, and 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 I would I would my gut feeling is they should be favored by about two and a half points. Yeah, um, it'll be a classic game. Let, let's talk Pittsburgh. And I was thinking about this. So Green Bay and Pittsburgh are very similar. Loyal, smaller market, not big free agent players, winning organizations, both draft and develop at a very, very high level. Uh, the difference is one has an offensive coach and an offensive culture. Holmgren, McCarthy, LaFleur, Favre, Rogers, Love. One has a defensive coach and very much a defensive culture. They spend their money on defense. The, the difference is the Packers have shown an ability to just keep hitting on quarterbacks. Between Bradshaw and Big Ben, there were a lot of misses. Kenny Pickett feels like a very average player. Rudolph's been around for a while. Limitations, lower ceiling. Um, and I think Green Bay rolls this weekend. And if I look at Green Bay going forward, I get nothing but answers. Speed, quarterback, coach, uh, salary cap. They'll go spend money on an edge rusher. Like I got nothing but answers with Green Bay. Pittsburgh is picking the right guy. Is Tomlin perfect? Are they going to spend money on offense? What do you do in the draft? Do you have to address the local kid that's not much better than your backup? And I and I and this is not. It's just funny when I look at Pittsburgh today and forward. I have nothing but questions, despite the fact they have good players everywhere. I like a lot of it, but are they going to address this? Well, to Holmes, me, I Allen, Lamar, now C.J. Stroud, Burrow. Their division's packed at quarterback. I don't pivot on my take that this has run its course with Mike Tomlin. Like today, making the playoffs as some seven seed and losing by a couple touchdowns does not change my opinion. Uh, and I thought that was defined this season. What, what were they watching at practice to keep rolling with Mitch Trubisky over Mason Rudolph? Right, Mason Rudolph's not your franchise quarterback, but he was way better than Mitch that they were losing games with, which forced them to play everybody in that final game. And today they didn't have T.J. Watt. I mean, that's, he's one of the best players in the league. And they got there because they were in a position of loyalty. Mitch Trubisky, we paid him $8 million. It's like, guys, have you guys watched this guy play over the last five years? What are you doing? Say what you want about Mason Rudolph. He made some plays today. Yeah. Him, and, him and Trubisky, are there, there's a wide gap. Yeah, but, but I'm with you. I mean, there is a culture in Green Bay, and it go, goes back to Ron Wolf and Holmgren, quarterback, 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 quarterback. Yeah. And in this league, you can't just roll out Tommy Maddox or some of these guys and expect to compete. You have no chance, none. I mean, not a snowball's chance in hell. And like you said, the division, it, they're in a different stratosphere. And, and now C.J. Stroud's in the conference. Herbert's going to get Harbaugh. Like, wh wh what are we doing? So yeah. I, I think 
I think it's time for divorce. I've been saying it for a while. The Tomlin thing, it doesn't reflect like he's some bum as a coach. He would get hired immediately. But I I think it's just time for a change. Now, organizationally, that's not their style. Let's face it. Beside Roethlisberger, they've really struggled at that position. right? Even with Cowher. It's not like they had big-time quarterbacks. Right. So, I mean, I remember being a kid, Neil O'Donnell, they were in the Super yeah. Bowl with. Like this, yeah. that's not Elway Marino or Steve Young or Aikman. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm with you. I don't I don't see much changing next year. Their organization's so well run, like the Packers with all the other positions, that they're never going to have a six-win season. So that's this right. notion saying that Tomlin never loses, well, most good coaches would be competitive with their roster. I mean, they're missing star players, and they still got studs everywhere. So yeah. I, I think that's a little overblown. I think it's time for a change. Now, will they do that? Obviously, highly unlikely. But there have been some rumblings out there that m- maybe we've come to a fork in the road and that they've had some management turnover. The longtime GM is gone. They got some new people running the organization. I, I think these next couple of days will be interesting if a story pops out of Pittsburgh that m- maybe they're both looking at each other. M- maybe if you're Mike Tomlin, you go, I, I don't want to coach these quarterbacks. Go well, somewhere else where you get better infrastructure. Dave Wanstat once told me that the Steelers were always a little reluctant to draft Pitt players, University of Pittsburgh players, because if they had to let go of the player or cut them, it wouldn't play well in the community. And the Roonies are so community based. And so if I'm Mike Tomlin, do I consider saying, I got a ring here, right? Like I've, I've done my job. I know this organization. Three more years of Kenny Pickett. They're not moving off him. I'm best served going to the market, doing Fox TV or CBS for a year. I mean, both those companies would hire him overnight. NBC, I mean, Mike, I mean, I can't say with any certainty, but I can tell you Fox, oh. CBS, in a heartbeat, our guys, and I, no inside information. We have smart executives. You'd absolutely call Mike Tomlin tomorrow, fly him out and say, let's talk. So my takeaway is it's not an indictment of Mike. It's a smart business pursuit. Let's do TV for a year. Show everybody like Sean Payton. Hey, when I come back in 10 years, you'll want to hire me. I'm really good at this stuff. And then wait for a really good young quarterback to hit in this draft and then go somewhere and win again. I don't think it's an indictment if after 10 years, you're looking around going, I kind of, I kind of think I can't win with this quarterback and my organization's not bailing on this quarterback. I mean, the Roonies would push back on that. But but don't you think there would be teams, you know, not everyone's going to land Harbaugh and Belichick. So the Washington football team, commanders, whatever the hell their name is, Atlanta Falcons, yeah, Belichick's on his yacht. Well, if the Cowboy job becomes available, the Atlanta Falcons are not getting Bill Belichick. So they'd be all over him. He's from, you know, that area, the Eastern Seaboard. I, I think Mike Tomlin would have to turn people down, right? The, the different, Sean Payton quit, right? To me, Mike Tomlin, now we'll see where his head's at, I think could immediately garner... 15 plus million dollars a year for a team that just wants some relevance and some importance well, think and just about get it. the train on. Think about Washington. They had the number two pick in the draft. I've known Adam Peters for a long time. He kind of knows what he's doing. I mean, that's that seems like a pretty good spot. Well, and also it, it, there's this thing in the media that if you, if you suggest what we're suggesting, you're anti-Tomlin. No, th- this is, by the way, Pete Carroll fired three times. Belichick now fired, basically fired twice. Yeah. Andy Reid fired The reality is what Mike provides, culture and toughness, the Steelers have that coming out of their ears. I agree. And and I was talking to a GM today. How many great cultures, because a coach sets the culture, and then the GM follows suit, becomes the mason, lays the bricks, right? You create the identity as a coach, the GM follows you. How many great cultures are they in the NFL? San Francisco, Baltimore, Pittsburgh, Green Bay, Los Angeles Rams. Chiefs. Philip. Uh, Chiefs, and I can name about four. There's about eight, nine. One of those is Mike Tomlin. So what it means is there's about 20 teams, 22 that don't have it. That's Mike's specialty. Toughness, um, alpha, uh, dog, um, culture. 20 teams need Mike Tomlin. So when people get defensive about Tomlin, it's like nobody is safe. By the way, Sean Payton and I had dinner. He knew. It's just time. I've been here. Breeze is leaving. It's just time to take a deep breath. So I'd love to see Tomlin in Dallas. Oh, I'd love it. (laughs) Pete Carroll was running out of town after back-to-back nine-win seasons of trading the best player in franchise history. 
right? So it's like, this is, this is a unique industry. You know, you, you can be successful, rattle off nine and 10 wins like Mike is and go, where are we really going with this? Even if we have to take a step back to take a step forward. And sometimes, you know, coaches have talked about this forever. Your message eventually kind of runs, its, runs yeah. its course. And that's where I think Pittsburgh is at. And they, they've done the same thing now, it feels like, for five straight years. They've looked the same when the season ended. It's not yeah. a failure. Most of the league would sign up for that. But in Pittsburgh, I, I would say they, they desire a little more. Here, here's the other thing that Tomlin is so good at. Just throw Dallas out. He's great in front of the mic. And a cowboy coach is in front of the mic. He is very capable of dealing with drama. Levy and Bell, A.B., he's more than capable of drama. Big Ben created some drama. <laughs> Pickens. I mean, they got a ton of guys. <laughs> so he can handle the mic. He'd be great. Jerry would say something, you know, that you have to dig out from under. Nobody would be better than Mike. He's the best guy in front of the mic in the league, has been for several years. He's just great at the podium. He can handle drama. The Cowboys always have it. And I think it's fair to say, in some big games this year, Niners, Buffalo, Green Bay, the Cowboys lack toughness. They yeah. really lacked. I mean, there were times Micah disappeared. The fact that this game was relatively close today speaks volumes of the, without T.J. Watt and with Mason Rudolph, tells you toughness. That was a brutal environment. I thought they were, when they scored that touchdown, I was like, how did they get within seven? How did this happen? <laughs> Colin, my first thought, ha you know, halfway through the first quarter was like, well, a 50 to 10 game is still better than no game. So I'm glad football <laughs> is on. But my, my theory, and I was thinking about it this morning at the gym, Jerry, just an all-time great marketer. Do you think, because even if he, he needed to sleep on it, the decision he has to have already made, but you don't want to fire your coach on a day where there are two games, even though it would be a huge story. It gets a loss a little in translation. Easier to pull the trigger Tuesday morning or Wednesday when – you kind of get the day to just be the whole headline? Or, or do you think he's truly just kind of pacing back and forth in his office thinking about it? Because I, I don't really know what to think about after. I've had 24 hours to think about that game. It still is one of the crazier things I can remember watching. Yeah, I think, you know, Jerry w may do it after next weekend would feel maybe more appropriate. Um, it There's no hurry to name it over the next 10 days, right? Like, there, there really well, you, is. You can't just hire Belichick Wednesday because of the new rules. So yeah, yeah, you're not you're not competing against other people to hire him by Thursday. So this is yeah. college football. And and basically, I don't know. I Tomlin would be way up at the top of my list. Vrabel and Tomlin for the Cowboys would kind of a no not because there's a lot of nonsense with Dallas. Tomlin and Vrabel are no nonsense. Yeah, and I think they'd be really good fits. DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL, is bringing you, yes, an offer that'll help you win money in the NFL playoffs. New customers, bet five bucks. That's it. Five bucks. That's it. Five dollars. Any game. And get $200 instantly in bonus bets. Are you kidding me? I bet five. That's it. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. It takes 90 seconds and put in Colin, C-O-L-I-N. Easy peasy. New customers, five bucks. That's all you have to bet. And get $200 instantly in bonus bets only on the DraftKings Sportsbook. The code is Colin, C-O-L-I-N. And the crown is yours. By the way, let's, let's pivot to talk about that game, the Cowboys and Packers. Let's talk about it again. Is that, did you see Matt LaFleur's reaction after the game? It was really something. Um, in week eight, I think it was, at home against Minnesota, he was bad. There were some 55% completion percentage pre-buy for Jordan yeah. Love. So this idea that Packer fans that were ahead of everybody on this, he was bad. Lafleur was condemning him after games and had to apologize like we were too hard on him. Lafleur's reaction after this Dallas game was one almost of disbelief. As if he was saying, I mean, he's good at practice, but we don't <laughs> see that. Yeah. I mean, he was like, that, that guy's, I mean, wow. Rarely do you see a coach act almost um, surprised by the performance. And it is interesting. So he's obviously always had it in him, right? He's obviously done this in moments. But I'm trying to think of a player I've ever seen in season 
that's improved like that. I, I can't remember anybody. Well, this is why Josh Allen, after one of the worst college careers statistically you'll ever see, gets drafted at seven. This is why people will still take a chance on Justin Fields. When you have physical tools in the sport of football with a huge arm and and you're a good athlete, you know coaches are going to want to work with you. And the overwhelming majority of them don't work. The other thing with football coaches, this is not basketball or baseball. You practice, you know, five times more than you play during the week. Right. Ray Lewis used to say, you pay me Monday through Saturday. Sundays are for free. So it's practice, (laughs) it's study, and it's, you know, coaches get very caught up in what it looks like in practice because for the most part, that translates to the game. Then there are the outliers, right? Allen Iverson didn't even show up to practice and then he could score 40 in a game. Barkley. That's not, yeah, this is, I'm not saying this guy's not trying or whatever in practice, but you can't. Part of what Aaron Rodgers, you had seen it so often in games, you knew what you had. When you have an unknown, especially he's not from, it's not like he had played at SC, Texas, or Bama, so you'd seen him in the, these guys were playing at Utah State, and they weren't even that successful of a program his last year there. So there was a lot of guessing, and rightfully, the contract told you everything you needed to know. It's like, yeah, yeah we're not going to pick up the fifth-year option, but we'll give you $11 million. I don't know if you saw all the incentives. I mean, it's hit like $7 million in incentives, yep. right? So it's been remarkable. But listen, the most powerful thing you can have in football is the head coach who's also the play caller because when he can develop that guy, no matter how much success your program has, Sean McVay, Kyle Shanahan, Andy Reid, Sean Payton, now LaFleur, you can't hire that guy away. This is not college. I can't pluck your head coach. So you yeah. have the most valuable asset at, from on your coaching staff who's, who's always standing next to Jordan Love going over is Matt LaFleur. I think Matt LaFleur, not that I questioned him, but – you know, it's kind of, listen, you inherited Rodgers. You said it's one of the great all-time openings. I mean, you got back-to-back MVPs. He kind of met him in the middle. Remember, Aaron didn't do the entire offense. He liked the shotgun stuff. Now they've instituted this playbook. Jordan has no choice, but hey, I'll do whatever you guys want me to do. The organization, great job around him. And the rest is history. Even if they lose this game coming up by 17 points, what a freaking season. I mean, what, if I'm a Packer, can you imagine being a Bears fan or a Minnesota Vikings fan? These teams run through quarterbacks constantly, and you see the Packers do this. Uh, because he made those throws last night, even if the game, quote-unquote, is a little easier to throw, as Brady would say, because you're not getting lit up across the middle, that ability to throw off your back foot and throw lasers 30-plus yards on a string and hit guys over the shoulder with the DB in front of them, only a small hand, like only a small handful of guys can can do that. Well, and I was well, as I was watching that game, I was thinking to myself, this is another reason you got to go get Caleb Williams if you're Chicago. You, you've got yeah. three years of Justin Fields. I've got one year of Jordan Love. Think about Jordan Love's improvement week eight to now like week nineteen per se. It, it's a different. It's like it's like almost. I said today it's like a guy went from missing the cut at the Valero Open to a nine stroke lead at the Masters on Saturday in like <laughs> yeah. eight weeks. You're like, what am I doing? Justin Fields, I got three years. We've got these tiny incremental leaps. Like usually star quarterbacks are either good initially, CJ Stroud, or they do a a Josh Allen, a Jordan Love. We're over like a 10-game stretch. You're like, whoa, 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 whoa. There's the magic. And I think some of it is building relationships with the young receivers. But I, as I watched that, I thought, okay, Chicago, fan fanboys, you got to go restart the clock because to beat Green Bay going forward – you got to go buy some players because you don't draft offense like the Packers do. And right now, Fields is not close to Jordan Love. Well, imagine me and you were, you know, ran the Chicago Bears front office and we showed up to the office this morning after not just watching Jordan Love, but also saw Jared Goff, who's under contract next year for $25 million, yeah. who they clearly like. Those two guys are going nowhere and those teams have a lot of talent. So what can they both do? Throw from within the pocket. Now, Love can move, Goff can't, but... Goff can really throw from within the pocket, and they happen to have the best offensive line who's all under contract. So I've been saying this forever. Caleb Williams is going to be their quarterback. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. I don't even think it's a question internally, but obviously it's going to be an internet conversation. I, I Listen, does Justin Fields go for a second, a fourth? It doesn't really matter. You're, you're drafting Caleb Williams, number one, and now, you know, a couple hours ago he officially declared, which he always was going to do, but Caleb Williams is going to be a bear unless him and his dad, you know, pull in you know, Eli or John Elway. But even then, if I'm the Chicago Bears, I'm just drafting them and we'll figure it out. Yeah, I feel the same way. So, you know, I was I was thinking 
um, yesterday I said this, is that there's not as many franchise quarterbacks as you think. Stroud and Jordan Love are very significant because the AFC and the NFC both get another young star quarterback. And I counted 17. I did not count Geno Smith. I count Derek Carr. Um, I don't consider him top 10, 12. Um, I counted Kirk Cousins off an injury. Uh, I did count Aaron Rodgers, though I don't think his career. I think he's got about a year left behind that O-line and he may just wave the white flag. But it's, it is remarkable. I, I counted 17, maybe 18, if you count Baker Mayfield, who I give a contract to. We, You know, if the number's right, probably in the teens, as you noted. But it, it's pretty remarkable, John. It's about 55% of the league has a franchise quarterback. And it leads me to believe, I thought about this, due to the injuries and the scarcity of them. Could I make an argument, unless you have a young one, who who's healthy, like at Buffalo, you could draft a quarterback every single year, every now, obviously some year, second round, some fifth. But when you watch a Brock Purdy come out from Iowa state and you're like, shit, I'm going to draft one of these guys. It may be the fifth, you know, Belichick did it every other year. Garoppolo, yeah. Ryan Mallett. He, he drafted a lot. Andy Reid watched- did it for years in Philadelphia. And, and by the way, most won't hit. If one out of four does, you sell them on the market. Or when your guy gets hurt for three games, you can win one of them. But I, I thought watching this, I'm like, I, I don't know with a quarterback, the league is so quarterback-centric, if you don't draft one a year. Well, I'll, I'll tell you one thing I thought about this morning was, one, I can't even imagine St- if, if Stafford could get out of bed this morning. I, you know, Would he have been able to play if they had won that game? But aren't they a team that, if you told me they traded up five spots in the first round and drafted a guy in the teens – and kind of tried to pull a Mahomes, Alex Smith, and redshirted. Who cares they drafted Stetson Bennett in the fourth round? Hell, he wasn't even around this season. Like, it's just whatever. Move on. Yeah. Right? I, I treat it like the 49ers with Trey Lance. Look, they're a good example. Boom, pivot. Get more guys in. Go sign Sam Darnold, Brock Purdy. Just keep churning that bad boy. And even if you have a high price guy, look look at the uh, the Detroit Lions. They, they drafted Hendon Hooker last year off an ACL. He's the backup to, to Jared Goff. So... I'm totally for that. I think a lot of teams, though, in the 20s, you know, we'll see Pittsburgh, but we we talk so much about Seattle and we'll have to see who their new head coach is. But aren't the Rams a team that you you just watch Stafford, you go, how many more years is he going to? And he was remarkable last year, but is is his body going to hold up? I mean, he's a 35 year old. The body has to feel like he's 56. You know, like Roethlisberger at the end, you're like, God, he's just, he's been through the war. You know, that's what Stafford feels. To me, the Rams are a team. I, I, and they have other needs, but you have to look and go at any moment. Th- this this guy does not feel like he's just walking off in the sunset the way he's Here, played over his 14, 15 years. Here's in my gut feeling on that, that they believe with their draft picks and cap space, they're going to go buy an edge rusher. They need it. They're going to go get another receiver. Cooper Cup's aging. They want another back. They're going to go get a left tackle. If Havenstein moves, uh, they're going to get a defensive end. My guess is they may buy a tight end and an edge rusher. Higby may not be ready for the start of next year. They like a, yeah. David Allen, the backup from Clemson's okay. He's a backup. My take is they're going to go one more year with Matt Stafford, Wentz the backup. You can win games with Wentz. They're, they're yeah. Actually, they're very similar players. Arm, little reckless, played in big games. Um, Stafford's a better, a better player. Obviously, yeah. I think they're going to go one more year. And then the take is, and they'll convince Aaron Donald to stay. Then... McVeigh has been, and it'll be a good team next year. They'll be a very good team next year. I agree. Um, because Kobe Turner, uh, uh, Avila, the, the interior, Young, the rush end, Huka, they hit on like four or five draft picks. It's a good scouting department. McVeigh, I think they'll go to the market. I think they'll just say, listen, there's four quarterbacks available in the market. Wouldn't you choose McVeigh? Yeah. So my my take you'd That's have how the Pooh. Niners got Sam Darnold for two million dollars, right? So like, he wanted to come there to rehab so himself. I think they're gonna run Matt back. They're gonna try to embolden the offensive line, which by the way, if Hayden I'm not Stein's, saying getting rid of Stafford, I'm saying almost do a Mahomes Alex Smith have a guy around him, but you you'd have to use a high pick probably to get a guy you like. Yeah. I think they're gonna run it back. I think they think they can be a Super Bowl team next year. I think they were they knew in the building their defense is young, needs another year, and they have about four holes to fill. And the scouting department, they trust. They have their first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. So, but I do think the advantage to having an offensive coach 
is as your quarterback ages, it, they age a little more elegantly, not inelegantly like ben, Big Ben. And the second thing is when the market um, has free agent quarterbacks, they look to you. They, yeah. I mean, I mean, hell, Elway didn't. Elway was a front office guy, and he recruited Peyton Manning. Peyton trusted Elway's brain power in the building to go to Denver. I think McVay's comment after the game too was pretty powerful, essentially saying like these guys made me fall in love with football again because he clearly almost tapped out and had enough of it last year, and now he has this young team where you're kind of bullish on the future. It's almost like a college coach that's a little older signs like a four year deal. Like guys, I'm not going anywhere, and he kind of I, I thought was pretty open and honest with that comment of like. I'm here. Like we we got a chance to be pretty good in the next several years. I mean, Puka, what he did last night in all season, I don't think it's you can overstate. I mean, that's one of the greatest. You know, Randy Moss was sexier looking the way he played, but it's his impact. I mean, this that guy's an unstoppable force. And it's not like you bet. Like, well, he's the number two. Well, he, no, he was way better than Cooper Cup, given how he's not the same player right now based off the injuries. So when you're going into a game, you're trying to take Puka Nakua. You know where Matt Stafford's looking. And they, no one can cover him. I don't care if you got the Lions DBs or good DBs. That guy is getting seven to ten catches every single game. He is what a draft pick. I mean, that's that's remarkable. Had they not taken it was funny after the draft the next day I said I didn't love the Stetson Bennett pick, but their second round pick aces. Their two thirds aces. Their fifth they got Allen and Puka Nakua. They had a hell of a draft and and. I what talked you th- out of it too. You loved them, and I thought they were going to suck, and they were well. They were anything the but that. They they were damn good down the stretch. Stafford and Aaron Donald, I argue, are still top five in the league at their position. Maybe top three. I mean, I think Stafford's yeah. that good. Oh, he's elite. But Donald is so perpetually triple teamed. Did you see multiple times Detroit <laughs> yeah. tripled him, and he stopped rushing because his feeling was, well, I've done my job. I've taken three offensive linemen. You guys go get them is if they can keep talking, I think he has two more great years, and I think Stafford's got two more. Um, so I, I think Cooper Cup, you could argue it's time to move off him. Can you get a fifth-round pick for him? But Or he could restructure his deal, because they do have some cap space. The the analytical community is always down on linebackers. They, they view them like utility players, like in baseball. And I've always pushed back on that, having lived through the Willis and Bowman teams, and now with Fred Warner with the Niners. Ernest Jones, 53. No one talks about him. He's easily one of the best linebackers. He's definitely probably the best blitzing linebacker. And Michael Lombardi has always said this. When your middle linebacker is fast and impact player, your whole defense plays like that. To me, he lifts their level of play. Think yeah. about last year. Bobby Wagner, they they signed. He was old, not the same player. They pivoted off him. They, went, they, they built the defense now around Jones in the middle. Look how much better their unit is. And they yeah. might get lucky. Raheem Morris... You know, should get a second chance, but who knows? Maybe defensive coaches, a lot of other big name coaches on the market, they might be able to just bring him back. You bring this coaching staff back. McVay turned over that whole staff, right? Six, yeah. seven new guys like Ryan Wendell, their offensive line coach. How much better was their offensive line this year than it has been year past? And they have some good young players, but just a remarkable job as an organization. All right. Um, I'm going to go watch the Eagles. I, I do like them to just kind of ground it, grind it out on the ground. That's my gut. Let's make a prediction. What do you think it'll look like? I think this thing's going to get weird. I I, <laughs> I, I I don't know, Colin. I mean, under no circumstances should you take the Bucks, but that's one of the weirdest endings of a season we've ever seen. And when, when to me, there's a pressure. I've lived in that city, that team. This coach, now the question marks with all the other coaching opportunities, you know, their ability to quote unquote upgrade over Sirianni. If this thing, AJ Brown's injured, I mean, he's a huge, think about Jalen's play once they traded for him. You know, they're off the field buddies, and now he's gone. Devontae Smith's been banged up. Uh, Todd Bull is a pretty good defensive coordinator. If this thing's close, that Eagles team could get tight. You yeah. know, th- their magic ran out. Let's, you know, let's, the last seven, eight weeks, right? The, the first, that 10 and one start is like, how are they winning these games? So if this thing's close, I, I like the Buccaneers. Uh, John Middlecoff, former NFL stout, scout for the Eagles, three and out podcast. You see the hat as always. Great talking to you, bud. See you, Colin.